Hey guys, so we are back for our last uh, content week on the four marginalized communities, thinking about the struggles of Asian Americans in the 20th century and contemporarily. So um, we're going to talk about some pretty heavy material. Um, today is going to center on uh, colonialism and war in Asia and kind of enduring racialization. Um, and next, we're going to talk about Asian hate crimes or hate crimes against Asian Americans. So uh, I just want to provide kind of a sense of what we're go doing and, and give some trigger warnings in case some of the topics that we talk about are a bit heavy. As always, you know, try to watch these videos in pieces. Uh, I do it as a full lecture because it's just easier to do it as one long stream of consciousness rather than trying to break them up into smaller units, given the kind of general content area. So <clears throat> with that, you know, uh, be mindful, stay tuned. Thank you always for tuning in. Um, but just uh, be clear that, you know, today's going to be, you know, or the next couple of sessions, I should say, are going to get a bit heavier. Okay. So first, um, let's get into it. So today we're thinking about the 20th century and the continuing Asian problem. Um, as you may have remembered, a lot of the political framing around um, race in the United States is always centering these things as problems, right? So there's the African American or the, or the Negro problem, there's the Latinx problem, there's the Indian problem, right, or the Mexican problem. And so, uh, like with all those other folks, we also have a problem with Asian, Asian and Asian Americans. And as we saw previously with the Chinese Exclusion Act, a lot of this was tied to immigration, right? What to do with coolies, what to do with these immigrants who are now here, and how do we kind of reconcile our um, vehement racial animus towards um, immigrants and Asian American, Asian people specifically, um, while also trying to figure out what to do with our capitalist system, which relies on and needs, you know, undocumented labor, right, or, or marginalized uh, immigrant labor, right. So today, uh, we're going to think about this in terms of warmongering, right, and how does the US reconcile its desires to be an imperialist power, also supporting democracy, and then engaging in wars where um, it actually engages or does some pretty nasty stuff. And in later examples, it uses some pretty heinous um, tactics of warfare. So we're going to think about the enduring Asian racism, the Filipino problem, the Japanese problem, the Korea Vietnam problem, and then lastly, anti Asian sentiments in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay. Uh, all of these things essentially rest, uh, escalate into. Uh, what we now know as our kind of uh, anti-Asianness today. So one, as we start to have these conversations and as we're still dealing with COVID and, and whatever this looks like in the future, we really need to understand that there's this, this new spat uh, of anti-Asian sentiment is not new necessarily, it is a rather a historical echo of racism that's been happening against this community. And if we go back to Natalia Molina, which we read in that beginning, um, you know, those beginning semester or beginning part of the semester, I'm sorry, around Latinx history, um, how race is made in America. Once a profile of racism or racialization is um, developed and defined, it's easily applied to other groups. So hence we see this here, right? Our key term for today is zoomorphism. And this means that we're gonna assign a person, event, or deity with animalistic characteristics. Now, in the context of racism, this is to denigrate somebody's uh, position ideally to make uh, a culture, ethnicity, or person seem animal-like, right? And in doing so, we're dehumanizing them, which again is, a, is kind of a <clears throat> marker or touchstone of racism, right? We're always attempting to dehumanize folks. And in this case, what we're doing here, and we'll see this particularly with the Japanese problem, is that Japanese folks were seen as this kind of animal uh, and this very um, verministic animal that needed to be dealt with, okay? So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we understand that anti-Asian sentiment has been building over the over the years, right? This is not something new, but at each point is an evolution in the chain. Um, and then what we'll see, especially when we think about anti-Asian sentiments in COVID, is that there was a lot of um, kind of vehement anger and, and animus uh, directed towards Chinese folks because um, of this false assumption that they were to blame for um, COVID-19. But this anti-Asian sentiment um, was very widespread, right? And it, it, it arched across all communities, although the kind of marker around it was um, this idea that um, Chinese folks were bad, right? And so we saw folks from Thai, uh, Thailand or uh, folks who were Thai, had Thai background, I'm sorry, uh, um, Filipino, all various types of sub 
or Asian subethnic backgrounds uh, being targeted with this anti-Chinese or anti-Asian sentiment. Um, and that's largely because the U.S. doesn't have good uh, race literacy, right? Um, all brown folks are essentially Mexican without any nuance on whether or not they're Cuban, Central American or Caribbean, right? Uh, South American, whatever it looks like. Um, we can't really tell whether or not folks who are African American are actually from the continent of Africa or historically black, right? Meaning that they're, they're descendants of slaves. Um, in the same context with the Asian Americans, right? Uh, we don't understand whether or not they're Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Japanese, you know, whatever that looks like. And with Native communities, as we've seen in the Native American unit, there's a veracity and variety of, of different Native American communities, cultures, and backgrounds. However, we all think of them as just quote unquote Indians, right? So um, <clears throat> we wanna know that there are a couple of notable periods where we see this anti-Asian sentiment start to get ratcheted up. Um, but again, that it starts with this kind of anti-Chinese sentiment um, you know, around the coolie labor system and then, you know, solidified with the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? So um, each community that we're going to talk about today has um, specific um, struggles. Uh, and so I parted it out in that way to make this a bit more easily digestible. So first, we're going to look at Filipinos. Um, Filipinos um, have been in the United States for a while, largely due to the Spanish-American War. Um, however, the entanglement with the U.S. in the Spanish-American War and uh, kind of um, in quote unquote support of Filipinos was not necessarily as altruistic as it may seem. And rather what we need to understand is that it's a part of a long process of um, the US trying to uh, become colonialistic or uh, advancing a kind of colonialist power framework and then also utilizing immigrant labor for exploitative purposes. We also see this with Japanese immigrants um, early on. And then we have this kind of antagonistic relationship around World War II uh, with the Pearl Harbor attacks, um, which led to, um, you know, Japanese internment or concentration and the utilization of WMDs or weapons of mass destruction. Uh, and then Chinese and Korean and Vietnamese immigrants um, are racialized within the context of World War II, or I'm sorry, the Cold War in the 80s. Um, and the U.S. kind of takes a carte blanche approach to invading these countries, particularly Korea and Vietnam, as Korea is uh, fighting a civil war in Vietnam, is starting to be taken over by communist forces. Uh, and then we see a utilization of, of very heinous weaponry in these regions, which then leads to this kind of weird back and forth where um, I'm only going to focus on one example of anti-Asian violence in the late 1980s. But what's interesting about um, the case that you'll see in this example is that Japanese um, our anti-Japanese sentiments in deindustrialization actually led to uh, the death of a Chinese uh, uh, Chinese American, um, and again, this kind of weird compounding where um, our racial animus of the time gets targeted at the wrong communities. So first, let's talk about the Filipino problem, right? So the Philippines are taken as a prize of war after the Spanish American War in 1898. Um, so does the or so does the U.S. take. Uh, Puerto Rico and wants to retain control of Cuba, although it doesn't necessarily do that. Obviously, we saw this in Harvest of Empire, where basically, <coughs> excuse me, Cuba becomes kind of a client state until um, Fidel Castro and the Communist Revolution kind of unseats that relationship. Um, so initially, the U.S. supported, quote unquote, uh, Caribbean and Philippine secession from Spain, but it would not allow those peoples of the region to technically be free. It wanted to control them. And I want to be very clear that the U.S. in this case is not doing what it's saying. It's not saying that it wants to be the great liberator or follow its ethos of democracy that it events when it fought the Revolutionary War, as we've seen in the past. Um, it's always a, it's kind of a double-sided coin, right? So there's this sense that this is all for liberty, but it's only liberty for whites, right? And, and this is true in this case as well, right? So the U.S. essentially is seeking to become a European colonial power, right? Or a colonial power like its European predecessors. Um, and in doing so, it violently occupies the region, right? There's a huge war, the, uh, the Philippine-American War or Filipino-American War. Um, and in the process of the war, over 200,000 civilians die uh, and of many more forces. And it's a kind of a bloody occupation for roughly about uh, 40 years. The, the US finally relinquishes control over the Philippines in the 19, I think 1940s. Um, the video will give a little bit more detail on that. But the point is, is that we've overutilized, or I'm sorry, the point is that um, 
we see the U.S. imposing this imperialistic uh, framework or the, this imperialism on other countries and is not in any way um, centered on trying to support uh, people's struggles, but rather for those um, personal, economic, or um, political interests within the country, right? So it's the U.S. is doing this for its own benefit, not for the benefit of those that it's try, trying to, quote unquote, liberate. Today's question comes from Northern California. Mystic Adams of Woodland asks, why did the United States buy the Philippines from Spain when they could beat them? It seems like a simple question. I mean, why would someone pay for something when they could easily take it by simply beating the previous owner, right? It's a valid question, but I'm afraid that the answer is far more complicated. You see, we were taught in schools that the United States defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War of 1898. And as a result, the United States paid Spain $20 million to own the Philippines. And this was all formalized in the Treaty of Paris on December 10, 1898. It was a peace agreement between Spain and the United States that ended the war. It seems pretty simple. Spain was defeated by the U.S., so therefore, the United States is entitled to take over Spain's former colonies, right? Well, not exactly. Exactly. Because you see, what the official history do not tell us is that while it was true that the United States could beat Spain, and yes, they defeated Spain in Cuba, it was an entirely different story in the Philippines. It wasn't really the Americans who defeated the Spaniards in the Philippines. As I've mentioned in my previous videos, it was actually the Filipino Revolutionary Forces that did most of the fighting against the Spaniards. The Filipinos fought vigorously for their freedom, while their American allies were just watching and waiting to see what would happen next. By June of 1898, the Filipinos had already declared their independence. And by August, they already had effective control of pretty much most of the country, except for the capital city of Manila. And minor places such as the tiny fortified church in the small town of Baler, almost 200 miles up north. It is also important to note that during this time, Mindanao wasn't yet fully colonized, and it hasn't been fully integrated yet to what we now call the Philippines. But despite all of this, the Spaniards refused to accept defeat at the hands of the Filipino people. Instead, they chose to surrender to the Americans. It was more embarrassing for the once mighty Spanish Empire to recognize being defeated by brown people. For them, it was more honorable to surrender to their fellow white men instead of acknowledging brown victory. And since the United States is first and foremost a capitalist nation, it was easier for them to pay the Spaniards for the ownership of the Philippines. So basically, it was easier for them to buy the Philippines as if it was a piece of property than face the fact that they were invading a sovereign people and trampling on their rights and their freedoms. The United States had always been interested in acquiring colonies across Asia and the Pacific, but it was difficult for them to justify all of these since the United States was founded on the principles of freedom, justice, and democracy. Imperialism is simply the opposite of what the United States was supposed to be. Be. Imperialism is simply incompatible and contradictory to the true essence of liberty and democracy. Spain, on the other hand, was a dying empire and it was desperate to hold on to whatever is left of what was once the largest and most powerful empire in European history. They knew that they were losing grip and they wanted to make the most out of it. They tried to the bitter end to hold on to their last remaining colonies, namely Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and other minor islands. But when they realized that it was too late, they decided that it was more honorable to negotiate with the Americans than to face defeat. The negotiations in Paris started in October of 1898, and by November, Spain had agreed and accepted the demands of the United States to buy the Philippines for $20 million, and the peace treaty was formally signed on December 10, 1898. But throughout this process, the most important voice was ignored. The voices of the Filipino people were simply dismissed, as if they did not matter at all. The representatives from the First Philippine Republic who were present in Paris were intentionally kept out of the talks. They pleaded with their American allies, but the Filipinos were denied participation in discussing the future of their country, the future of their people, despite the fact that they had already won their independence from Spain and that the Americans were supposed to be their allies. The United States decided to buy the Philippines perhaps because it was 
easier for them to justify a purchase than to recognize the sovereignty of the Filipino people. They saw an opportunity to legitimize their occupation of the islands, and by doing so, they stepped on the rights of the Filipino people and spat on the true principles of freedom, democracy, and justice. By buying the Philippines, they thought that they could easily forge a new global empire, but instead, their betrayal entangled the United States in a bloodier war and plunged the Philippines and its people into a violent occupation and merciless genocide. It's an almost forgotten chapter of history known as the Philippine-American War. And that is it for me today. And always remember, no history, no self. No history, no self. See you next time. Or into <clears throat> So as we can see, right, this <clears throat> period of time creates this condition where the U.S. is trying to essentially exert power, right, at the end, utilizing or becoming, or I should say, being very opportunistic as the Philippines are wanting to secede, but rather, um, rather than really uh, advancing democracy, it wants to control these folks. And, and sadly, it comes at the heels of the, of the Spanish empires or, or the former European powers not wanting to essentially, excuse me, um, uh, give up or give up land to, to brown people, right? In this case, they don't wanna show that they've been beaten by a bunch of brown islanders in the Philippines. This is also true of what we saw with France and Haiti, as there was a gigantic slave revolt that basically allowed for Haiti to become the first independent black republic or independent republic of former slaves. And so those two um, conditions created this or this situation where the U.S. eventually retained control, but ultimately can't sustain their control because they end up having to fight an additional bloody war. And sadly, as we've seen with Native Americans, right, the U.S. will engage in genocide to retain um, territories that it so desires, as we saw with Manifest Destiny, right? So all of these things are all kind of interconnected and, and tying together, right? Um, and so um, the Filipino problem then also becomes a labor exploitation problem. So it's a, it's about colonial control, and then obviously the ex and the exploitation of the people on the on and off the island, right? So <clears throat> the U.S. is trying to figure out whether or not it wants to expand its role in the Philippines and engage in this kind of paradoxical relationship of colonialism. Um, and then as Filipino immigrants start to, to come in mass um, because of the instability on the island, it creates a new labor system akin to the coolie system, which you've seen in the past. So we already have an existing framework for exploiting Asian immigrants like chateau slaves guess what? We don't have any Chinese immigrants anymore. Let's use Filipinos instead, right? We're using the same logics of race and racial domination, racial oppression, just on a new community, right? Copy and paste, Natalia Molina, that same kind of idea, right? <clears throat> and so we see that, right? You can see all of these depictions here on the right where they're infantilizing, animalizing, tribalizing, uh, savagizing, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, Filipino peoples uh, in, you know, as a, as a ploy or a proxy to say that they should be dominated, right? And so here, um, what we need to understand a part of this history is that because <clears throat> Filipino immigrants were coming in mass, there was this desire to reconcile them to the hard labor jobs. And actually Filipino immigrants were some of the first farm workers alongside Mexican immigrants during um, both of the massive movements north um, immediately after the Mexican Civil War in the early 1900s, and then obviously the Bracero program, and actually Filipino farm workers working in conjunction with Latino farm workers actually was what really helped to solidify and move forward um, <clears throat> the uh, Chicano Civil Rights Movement or the Farm Workers Movement, which this next video will detail a bit more about. <laughs> It's a part of American history that was almost forgotten when farm labor leaders went on strike in California in the 1960s against the backdrop of the civil rights movement, one group played a pivotal role in the worker and immigrant rights. I never knew this history growing up. I don't think uh, anyone from my community knew about it. Marissa Arroy is talking about the Filipino community who make up the third largest Asian population in the U.S. As a filmmaker, she is keeping the story alive. In the 20s and 30s, over 100,000 Filipino men flocked to America seeking new opportunities. They became migrant workers and followed the crop cycles all over the West Coast. Larry Itliong and the Filipino Manos, which means elder, began the Delano grape strike to protest the unjust wages and poor working conditions of farmers. I'm gonna be very frank with you. I have all kinds of guts, you know. 
I'm not scared of nobody. And I'm a son of a bitch in terms of fighting for the rights of Filipinos in this country. Farm owners often pitted Filipino workers against Mexican workers in an attempt to sabotage the protests. Despite those attempts, the biggest protest, the Delano grape strike, was built on the partnership between the two groups. <laughs> on September 8, 1965, Filipino farmers led by Larry Itliong protested unfair wages and working conditions. Cesar Chavez, who led the Mexican farmers, wanted to wait two or three years before they protested. But Itliong told Chavez they couldn't wait. The Manongs were getting old. Where are your brothers and sisters over here? Come on! Come on now! Itliong asked him to join forces, and together they founded United Farm Workers, or UFW. The work he did was significant enough to get us a union. You know, at a time when I think for the most part, Filipinos didn't really speak up. The strike lasted five years and gained national and international support. The successful protests resulted in a contract granting farmers fair wages, benefits, and protections. It's so important to humanize and let communities know and let kids of color and their families know that we are part of American history. Gail Romasanta co-wrote a children's book about Larry Itliong that was published this year. Filipino Americans now. Sorry. And let kids of color and their families know that we are part of American history. Gail Romasanta co-wrote a children's book about Larry Itliong that was published this year. Filipino Americans, now that we've been here for a few generations now, you can ask to be at the seat at the table and you can demand why your story isn't out there. It's a story still relevant today about the rich and the poor, unions, immigrant backlash, the food we eat, and the workers who get the food to our tables. Roma Santa says it's a story about dignity. And when you start looking at support systems for our communities, um, and for our marginalized communities, for those who don't necessarily speak out or ask for a seat at the table. This story is for you because it asks you to do more. You can do more. Itliong and the Manongs are remembered beyond Filipino American History Month. In 2013, California rewrote their history textbooks to include Filipino Americans in the farm worker movement. There is a school named after Itliong and another Manong. Filipino labor leader Philip Veracruz, and the Golden State now recognizes October 25th as Larry Itliong Day. Okay. So obviously important contributions, but again, showing how the U.S. exploits, in this case, um, immigrant workers, right? And then as the previous video suggested, we're still seeing that kind of antagonistic colonial relationship. So actually within the Asian American community, we can actually see two kind of historical echoes, right? This desire for colonialism, as you saw with the, the climate American, crisis is a problem then, for everyone, uh, but the response can be an uh, opportunity then, for everyone too. That's why I'm... And um, yeah, the, so the colonialism that we saw with Native Americans and then the, the desire to exploit people like with chattel slavery, as we saw both with chattel slavery itself and with um, uh, the coolie labor system, right? So um, around the same time, the Japanese problem starts to emerge. So um, Japan at first starts to reach out to the US to modernize um, as it does with the Europeans. Um, you may have seen the historical fiction, um, Last Samurai with Tom Cruise. This kind of gets evinced in there where there's this desire to kind of uh, move away from uh, factiony warlord samurais to something that is much more in the West view. Um, and so there's this kind of odd, complicated relationship between the U.S. and Japan. Um, specific, and then uh, there's a historic gentleman's agreement between the two countries where immigration starts to get normalized in extent. But um, yeah, so we start to see um, this new bond form between the two countries, which actually starts to lead to some um, uh, mu munition and militaristic exchanges and then the exchange of immigrants and the converse. So um, uh, Japan, uh, or Japanese immigrants were coming to the U.S. Um, due to instability in the region and then obviously the discovery of gold, right? So we see um, a large amount of Japanese immigrants come to the U.S. Uh, seeking gold like Chinese immigrants and other immigrants during the gold rush. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act also accelerates this because as we start to have a more um, adversarial relationship and racially antagonistic relationship with 
um, Chinese, Japanese become, again, the supplant, right? So we get rid of one group, we bring in another, we bring in Filipinos and Japanese, right? Um, and uh, at the same time, we also realized that Japanese were, you know, kind of struggling to become white. In 1922, Ozawa, right, is arguing that he can be counted as a citizen because he meets all of the cultural markers, right? He speaks English, he's gone to higher education, he has a great job, he does all this other stuff. However, the courts deem him as ineligible for citizenship because he's effectively not white. So the U.S. again, you know, bringing folks in, telling them that they can come here for opportunity, but never really recognizing them as full citizens, right? And we can see the sheer growth of this from 1870 to 1940. I mean, a massive amount of Japanese folks coming to the United States. So it is not in any way, shape, or form that we see a... Um, a, uh, uh, a, minimal, a minimalistic amount of Japanese folks coming here, but rather actually a significant amount of immigration. This gets complicated though, because during World War II, Pearl Harbor happens, right? So Pearl Harbor uh, is a attack on a, um, a uh, I'm sorry, on a military base in Honolulu. Um, you know, you can still go to the, the Pearl Harbor Memorial site today. Um, and uh, it ushers in this kind of new dynamic. China wants to essentially ally with the U.S. Um, to be to fight back uh, Japanese imperialism that's going on and Russian imperial or I'm sorry Germanistic imperialism. So Chinese now become accepted in the late 19 or in the mid to late 1940s, and then Japan becomes an enemy right because of this attack. And so while these attacks were devastating, it ushered in this kind of new racialization for the U.S., where essentially we see, um, you know, the Japanese kind of turned into this um, uh, unethical and animalistic enemy, right? And I provide a lot of examples here where you see them seen as rats, right? You can see a lot of this sense of them being the enemy, right? And they're actually being excluded. And I'm sorry, there should be another slide in here that echoes this kind of framework. But um, basically, in the 1940s and, and shortly thereafter, there was a, a deep-seated um, hatred uh, against Japanese uh, folks, um, and really this kind of uh, push to construct um, Japanese as rats, right? And, which is evinced by the variety of different pictures that you see here, right? Which again leads, leans, or sorry, leads us to this idea of zoomorphism, right? So again, assigning a person with as a person, event, or deity with animalistic characteristics. Here we see this, right? And again, this is explicitly done for the purposes of race, right? Let me make them seem animalistic, less than human, dehumanizing, so that we can incarcerate them in very problematic ways and also drop nuclear weapons on them, right? So this lead up to the racialization of Japanese folks um, immediately after uh, the Pearl Harbor attacks um, sets a cultural precedent for two really, or sorry, a political, historical, and cultural precedent for two really bad things. One is the Japanese internment program. So Executive Order um, 9066, put forth by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, allowed for the forced detention of 120,000 Japanese Americans. Um, and it did not matter their ancestral linkage, right? So if they were um, either fully Japanese, um, uh, or I'm sorry, if they were Japanese immigrants, um, uh, Japanese Americans, meaning that they were born here in the United States, or even if they had a fraction of Japanese blood, meaning that they were mixed race, they could be incarcerated. Um, they could have their property taken from them, uh, a variety of things. And the vi next video I'm gonna show you is gonna get into that in a bit more detail. Um, uh, but detainees essentially, and, and the, the construction of Japanese folks as the enemy was almost um, uniformly similar to what, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, what Nazi Germany did with the Jews, except for the death part, right? We didn't actually um, exterminate Jews, but we did We did incarcerate them in, in almost absolutely similar conditions, right? And did so under the basis of race and to deny them all political rights, uh, violating our own constitutional frameworks and all um, kind of conventions around human rights, right? So let me show this video clip first, and then I'm gonna talk about um, nuclear weapons second. <laughs> On December 7, 1941, 16-year-old Aki Kudose shared in the horror of millions of Americans when Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor. 
What she did not know was how that shared experience would soon leave her family and over 120,000 Japanese Americans alienated from their country, both socially and physically. As of 1941, Japanese American communities had been growing in the U.S. for over 50 years. About one third of them were immigrants, many of whom settled on the West Coast and had lived there for decades. The rest were born as American citizens, like Aki. Born Akiko Kato in Seattle, Aki grew up in a diverse neighborhood where she never thought of herself as anything but American until the day after the attack when a teacher told her, you people bombed Pearl Harbor. Amid racism, paranoia, and fears of sabotage, people labeled Japanese Americans as potential traitors. FBI agents began to search homes, confiscate belongings, and detain community leaders without trial. Aki's family was not immediately subjected to these extreme measures, but on February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066. The order authorized the removal of any suspected enemies, including anyone of even partial Japanese heritage from designated military areas. At first, Japanese Americans were pushed to leave restricted areas and migrate inland. But as the government froze their bank accounts and imposed local restrictions such as curfews, many were unable to leave, Aki's family among them. In March, a proclamation forbid Japanese Americans from changing their residency, trapping them in military zones. In May, the army moved Aki and her family, along with over 7,000 Japanese Americans living in Seattle, to Camp Harmony in Puyallup, Washington. This was one of several makeshift detention centers at former fairgrounds and racetracks where entire families were packed into poorly converted stables and barracks. Over the ensuing months, the army moved Japanese Americans into long-term camps in desolate areas of the West and South moving Aki and her family to Minidoka in southern Idaho. Guarded by armed soldiers, many of these camps were still being constructed when incarcerees moved in. These hastily built prisons were overcrowded and unsanitary. People frequently fell ill and were unable to receive proper medical care. The War Relocation Authority relied on incarcerees to keep the camps running. Many worked in camp facilities or taught in poorly equipped classrooms, while others raised crops and animals. Some Japanese Americans rebelled, organizing labor strikes and even rioting, but many more, like Aki's parents, endured. They constantly sought to recreate some semblance of life outside the camps, but the reality of their situation was unavoidable. Like many younger incarcerees, Aki was determined to leave her camp. She finished her final year of high school at Minidoka, and with the aid of an anti-racist Quaker organization, she was able to enroll at Friends University in Kansas. For Aki's family, however, things wouldn't begin to change until late 1944. A landmark Supreme Court case ruled that continued detention of American citizens without charges was unconstitutional. In the fall of 1945, the war ended and the camps closed down. Remaining incarcerees were given a mere $25 and a train ticket to their pre-war address, but many no longer had a home or job to return to. Aki's family had been able to keep their apartment, and Aki eventually returned to Seattle after college. However, post-war prejudice made finding work difficult. Incarcerees faced discrimination and resentment from workers and tenants who replaced them. Fortunately, Japanese Americans weren't alone in the fight against racial discrimination. Aki found work with one of Seattle's first interracial labor unions and joined the Congress of Racial Equality. She became a teacher, and over the next several decades, her advocacy for multicultural, socially conscious education would impact thousands of students. However, many ex-incarcerees, particularly members of older generations, were unable to rebuild their lives after the war. Children of incarcerees began a movement calling for the United States to atone for this historic injustice. In 1988, the U.S. government officially apologized for the wartime incarceration, admitting it was the catastrophic result of racism, hysteria, and failed political leadership. I'm going to stop it there. Uh, so 
um, what we can see with this example, right, is all of the tenants of not only a um, the Jewish concentration system, but if we remember back to the reservation project, this is also akin to this, right? So again, we're seeing these overlaps in historical truths, right? So the U.S. doesn't like a group, right? In this case, yes, um, Japan, well, right, as a country attacked this group, but what was what we can see with the Japanese internment program is that somebody seen deemed as the enemy, and in this case, where the historical parallel is with Native Americans as this kind of um, uh, enemy of manifest destiny, um, the the resulting action is to remove them, right? And in this case, internment camps, but in in the case of Native Americans, it is those reservations, right? Like with uh, Native Americans, we also want to make clear that what we're going to learn about next with the use of nuclear weapons is that the use of, of um, unorthodox, illegal, and or extremely unethical militaristic practices in the case of Native Americans, biological warfare with smallpox blankets, uh, or the, um, the uh, desire to starve those populations by uh, killing the buffalo, right? We saw that in the later part of the uh, the 1800s where um, there was a concerted effort to kill all the buffalo um, to their far star of the Plains Indians, we're gonna see this here, right? So um, the US drops two nuclear bombs in um, uh, August uh, August 6th and August 9th. So they're two almost two days apart, actually technically three days apart. Um, and it kills almost uh, uh, 400,000 people. Um, and mostly most of those folks are civilians. We also want to recognize that whenever we use nuclear weapons, of course, it's going to be, it's going to have much more heinous fallout. So, i.e., uh, you know, there are long-term consequences from nuclear disasters, um, you know, radiation poisoning, uh, soil contamination, so on and so forth. Uh, and um, it's also leads to congenital malformations with children, right? So all those folks who got radi radiation poisoning and then had children afterwards, um, had children that were um, genetically malformed. For the Americans, the war in the Pacific had been a costly yet successful campaign. In August of 1945, Japan had clearly been beaten. American and allied forces could take any position they wished in the Pacific if they were willing to accept the casualty. Dr. Rob Satino is the senior historian at the World War II Museum in New Orleans. It looks a bit unprecedented that one side has clearly been beaten, and, and yet the violence seems to be ratcheting up, getting worse and worse as the Allies have really now approached Japan's doorstep. Mashing at Japan's home islands in nine days of continuous bombardment. The U.S. had a choice, an invasion of Japan requiring a million troops or a top secret weapon. The Japanese were given an ultimatum, surrender or suffer dire consequences. That, of course, leads to the next major act in the drama. A single plane carrying a single bomb takes off from Tinian and drops that bomb over Hiroshima. And, and kills... 50 to 60 to 70,000 people. We are now into a completely new era. Perhaps 100,000 people incinerated in seconds. There was a lot of commotion and there was uh, people saying that there was a B-29 coming towards uh, Hiroshima. American Howard Kakita was seven years old, living with his grandparents near Hiroshima's ground zero. So my brother and I, his name is Kenny, my older brother. He and I, we climbed on top of the roof to watch the vapor trail. And fortunately, my grandmother being much smaller than us, she told us to get off the roof. An act that saved their lives. I didn't see the flash. I didn't hear the boom. I was knocked out instantaneously. When I came to, uh, which is I'm sure a number of minutes later, structure was on top of me. Uh, and things are beginning to burn around me. Somehow, Howard, his brother, and grandmother survived. This was not an ordinary bomb, but it was something much bigger. Everything was burning. They saw things no person should witness. There were already a number of people that were dead along the roadside. Uh, people were burned, suffering, and then, you know, begging for a drink of water. Some of the injuries were so severe that, for example, people with burns their skins would be dripping from their bodies. And some of the people actually had broken limbs, uh, you know, protruding 
when we came back after the uh, the surrender, we came back to the same area, and the whole city was completely flat. It was really devastating to see. Do you feel lucky to be alive? <laughs> You know, I, if we stayed on that roof when the bomb exploded, I would not be uh, speaking to you right now. So, yes, I feel extremely lucky. Howard and his brother lost their hair to radiation from the bomb, but tens of thousands not killed immediately that day would die in the weeks to come. That's my grandfather. He would die two years after that with uh, cancer. Howard is a hibakusha. That's Japanese for an explosion-affected person. The Hibakusha's message will be that we understand the misery and terror and death that it caused. In a world now armed with more than 10,000 nuclear weapons, what the Hibakusha fear is simple. Somebody's going to make a mistake and then push the one, that one button, which may cause other buttons to be pushed. The world that we know today will be gone. And so, again, right, we see the utilization of these kind of unethical, unethical, I'm sorry, and unorthodox weaponry against people, and particularly the enemy. And while uh, disconnected by territory, right, Native Americans living on the continental United States, um, you know, we see this here. And then another thing to know, obviously, is that as this is going on, right, we have the civil rights movement, we, which is also emblematic of, of the racism that was going on or the escalation of racism right prior to the 1950s and 60s where we see you know the outpouring of, of the civil rights movement. Um, secondly, uh, right, we want to note that the U.S. is already starting to thump around in you know areas of the civil uh, Central America trying to combat and or use unorthodox military tactics, i.e. train soldiers to, to engage in death squads and so on and so forth which again is always emblematic of this problematic relationship, the U.S. evincing this ethos of, uh, of civility, democracy, of ethics, and actually never doing that in practice, particularly with people of color, right? And so again, this kind of embedded racism in our society. So this gives rise to our next problem, which is the Korean, Korean and Vietnamese problem. So in this, um, Communist and capitalist countries are starting to really uh, divide up the world uh, in the post-World War II area. So we see the rise of the Soviets, the rise of a, of a counter-thinking to capitalism, uh, recognizing that um, capitalism was a part of the proxy for colonialism and the marginalization of a lot of people. Again, remember that capitalism is integral to, to chateau slavery, Right, we need money and we need money in mass. The easiest way to do so is to work people as slaves and, and, and accrue that wealth, um, you know, almost overnight. And so, um, these two um, political theories in countries that are supporting, supporting them or, or um, uh, political, social, and national frameworks, i.e., Europe and Europe, America, and um, Eastern Europe, um, and parts of Asia start to battle it out, right? So Korea fights a civil war, the US starts to get involved with that. Um, and then in Vietnam, uh, Vietnam is starting to change itself over and much of Southeast Asia and the US is basically saying, no, we don't wanna see this happen, right? Exactly like what we saw with Central America and um, the US getting involved to kind of stave off communism there. These wars set precedent for a variety of other reasons, but that are very akin to the issues in Japan. One, and the primary one, and I would say probably above all else, is the fact that we use other types of WMDs. So what I've provided you here are four kind of um, pictures. I'm gonna show one more in detail, um, but the use of napalm becomes really big. This is a very iconic picture. This girl is actually burnt. Um, she was uh, dusted with napalm. It's a gelatinous substance that burns white hot can stick to skin and melt it basically so she's actually covered in napalm um she had to rip her clothes off and that's why she's making it I'm, I'm, i apologize for the partial nudity um but again uh kind of emblematic and so all these children are, are basically covered in napalm and burning to your right you see a uh, white phosphorus which is another um chemical weapon that basically burns white hot uh and has very deleterious not only physical effects in terms of skin, but also with breathing. Um, if you get phosphorus into your lungs, it can be, um, it can be horrible. 
uh, on your respiratory system. Directly below that, you see examples of carpet bombing. So this is where you just basically lay off a bunch of bombs in an area um, to do what's called scorched earth tactics. So scorched earth is where basically you bombard an entire area, leveling any people, plants, or buildings in your wake. Uh, and then right next to that, you see cluster bombs. It was hard to get a better picture of these, but these are undetonated bombs. These are in Laos and Cambodia. So in Laos and Cambodia, there are big um, bomb shells, which are these giant metal, metal containers with smaller bombs that are about the size of a racquetball. Um, when those bombs blow off or blow up, because many of them are undetonated and have been left there along with um, landmines and other munitions, in the region, they can blow off limbs. And that's been a big problem in most of Southeast Asia where there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of unexploded munitions, uh, tank shells, mortar shells, bombs, landmines, where kids pick them up and think that there's a toy essentially or some kind of interesting object and it blows up and blows off their limbs, right? And so again, the US engaging in this kind of militaristic imperialism um, using all types of weapons of, of warfare that are, uh, again, unethical, unorthodox, so on and so forth, that have these really harmful effects. I'm not going to show this whole clip, but I want to show part of what's called Agent Orange. You may or may not have heard of this. Um, this is very controversial. But what I want you to pay close attention to with Agent Orange and its connection to nuclear bombs is how all of these connect back to how the U.S. engaged with um, a type of indirect militarism through the, through the slaughtering of buffalo to essentially starve off populations. One of the most controversial American operations in Vietnam. Just the name of it evokes all sorts of horrible images. Agent Orange. During the Vietnam War, Americans were told that spraying millions of acres of dense jungle with Agent Orange would deprive the Viet Cong of cover and save GI's lives. But in the decades since, the herbicide's use in Vietnam has been blamed for creating a human catastrophe among veterans. I died in Vietnam and didn't even know it. And the Vietnamese. Vietnam is convinced that these children are just the latest victims of the deadly chemical dioxin in Agent Orange. Now, more than 40 years later, the fight over Agent Orange continues to take new turns. Americans might like to consider our war in Vietnam to be ancient history. It's not ancient history. During the Vietnam War, the U.S. military fought an invisible enemy. Viet Cong fighters who quickly attacked, then slipped back into the dense jungle. In 1962, American forces responded with Operation Ranch Hand. Over the next nine years, spraying an area about the size of Massachusetts with defoliants, the most notorious being Agent Orange. It was one way we were going to win the Vietnam War, dump herbicides all over the jungle so the Viet Cong would come out and fight to both expose Viet Cong hiding places and deprive them of life-sustaining crops, large swaths of Vietnam were left barren. Enough food to feed 600,000 people for a year has been destroyed. Despite this sudden devastation, U.S. officials said the spraying created no lasting harm, and many agreed it was helping turn the tide on the Viet Cong. What they're doing amounts to a pretty important form of conservation in itself, the saving of American lives. But the communist North Vietnamese presented a different picture of Agent Orange, one that became increasingly horrific as time wore on. North Vietnam charged today that defoliants have produced many instances of miscarriages, congenital defects, and monstrosities among children. The U.S. government initially dismissed these charges as communist propaganda, but following a study that linked dioxin, a contaminant in Agent Orange, to birth defects in laboratory animals, the spraying of this herbicide was discontinued in 1970. The herbicide was also eventually banned in the U.S. That did not stop the growing concern about Agent Orange, which took a new turn a few years after the last American soldier had left Vietnam in 1975. Milton Ross, a special forces advisor near Play Coup, has a son born without the tips of his fingers. Frank Moore is nearly dead from cancer. He thinks the cancer was caused by chemical defoliant he was exposed to as a soldier in Vietnam. Thousands of Vietnam veterans think Agent Orange is now killing them. 
Bobby Muller, a former Marine lieutenant and veterans activist, was among those who demanded that something be done. One day I said, okay, I got a mouth and I'll use it. And I just started to talk. My voice got amplified and I became a spokesman. But. I'm going to stop it there just for time. But again, right, the use of, you know, kind of heinous tactics, even at the expense of our own soldiers, to essentially events or, or not events, but to exact the type of uh, goals, uh, nationalistic, militaristic, political, economic, uh, that the U.S. wants, right? And again, we want to be very clear that much of this uh, movement towards, you know, I guess, stopping communism, although communism never really did anything to capitalism to harm it, other than it's just they don't meet, mat, mesh up in terms of their um, political and economic frameworks uh, creates these conditions, right? So because the U.S.'s desires for control over land, let's say in the continental United States, uh, and the Native folks' uh, desire to just be stewards of the land and not have that kind of possessive control creates conditions for massive genocide, right? In this case, the same thing, right? So we have not only a genocidal proxy in the sense that Agent Orange was just essentially devastating crops and land, um, so much so that it was going to starve people to death. But it also had these long-standing health consequences that, as you could see with some of it here, and again, this although that's horrifying, horrifying, um, as you know, not nearly enough of the extent of what actually happened, creates these conditions where we want to be very mindful, right? The U.S. will do whatever it wants, or you know, whiteness, white supremacy as an as an ideology and and something entrenched in political societies will do what it wants to maintain that power and control, right? And so um, this kind of escalates, as I had mentioned, to these instances of police violence and, and, and interpersonal violence in um, the US in the late 80s and early 90s. So, you know, Vietnam goes on until essentially the late 70s and early 80s. And then eventually after that, we start to see the next phase of the U.S. Um, as the decline of the war economy happens and deindustrialization. So um, in the 1980s and the 1990s, we see a concerted effort to deindustrialize the society, um, largely because of economic policies pushed forward by Reagan and then by Bush uh, one and then Clinton much later. Um, and at the time, uh, there is much more globalization happening. So we have much more. Uh, different types of vehicles in our country, German, Japanese, uh, so on and so forth. And, so, and we have much more immigration, immigration, obviously, because of all the instability and, you know, screwing around that we did in the Asia and Indo-Pacific regions. And so the long history of anti-Asian racism stretching all the way back to the Chinese school system, all the way up, almost 100 years later, um, you know, after Japan, after the Philippine American War, after Korea, Vietnam creates this powder keg condition where essentially Asians can be an easy target for any instance, right? And we've just gone through major civil rights reforms where now all of the people of color across a variety of different situations are now, right, demanding their rights. And you have whites saying, wait, what's going on, right? And so, Unfortunately, in the case of Inchin Chin, which I'm going to show you in a second, which is not the only case of racially motivated violence against Asian Americans, um, we start to see this, this conflagration of racism, right? And, and this is where I want to be very clear that racism evolved, right? After the civil rights era, it doesn't go away. It just, it, it takes a new form. Um, and what we're going to see with the Vincent Chin case is that the anti-Japanese sentiments against, or the anti-Japanese sentiments actually start to get deployed against other people. And we see this also in the 90s during the Rodney King uprisings, where a lot of Koreans were targeted for their um, Asian-ness, essentially, uh, being in, in black and brown communities. And when law enforcement uh, had already had this full, you know, sordid history with police violence, um, so much so that it caused, the, you know, this massive um, racial uprising, essentially, when Korean American um, stores were under threat, uh, law enforcement didn't uh, come to their aid. And, and, and again, it's kind of this echo of a lack of support for marginalized communities, regardless of the circumstance, right? 
I want to make sure you know the story of Vincent Chin. On June 19th, 1982, Vincent Chin and his friends went out to celebrate his bachelor party. He was 27 years old and working as a drafter in Detroit, Michigan. He was a Chinese American, just like me. Now at this time, Detroit was facing hard times. The local auto industry was struggling and local leaders from politicians to union heads to car company execs were blaming Japan's auto industry and an influx of Japanese cars for the loss of jobs in Detroit. Michael Nitz had recently been laid off. His stepfather, Ronald Evans, was a plant supervisor at Chrysler. They happened to be at the same club as Chin and his friends. Witnesses said Nitz and Evans had started an altercation with Chin. I was close enough to hear Mr. Evans say to Mr. Chin, because of you motherfuckers were out of work. They scuffled and were thrown out of the club. But Evans and Nitz weren't done yet. They searched the neighborhood and tracked Chin down. When they found him, Nitz held Chin still as Evans hit him over and over again with a baseball bat until his skull cracked. Vincent Chin died four days later. Michael Nitz and Ronald Evans paid a $3,000 fine and were sentenced to three years probation. They never served a day for their crimes. I think the first time I really knew about Vincent Chin and what happened to him was in, in high school. I was shown the documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin? And I remember having a really hard time watching the documentary. The testimony of Vincent Chin's mom continues to haunt me. I can still see in my mind's eye what she looked like. She was shaking with grief. Please, I want everybody tell the government do not to drop this kiss. I want just for Vincent. I want just for my son. I couldn't imagine that someone would be beaten to death with a baseball bat because of who he was. And then when that happened and I saw the documentary, I have to tell you, it, it, it reset my concept of what it means to be an Asian American and Pacific Islander and how safe I felt and um, really turned things upside down. just showed in stark contrast how there is one system of justice for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, people of color, people who are invisible, immigrants, one system for them and, and one system for everybody else. And to our great shame in this country that persists. <music> People routinely say to me, friends, allies, William, I am shocked that this is happening to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I can't believe that we're capable of such cruelty. And I say, why are you shocked? You should not be surprised. You know, this country and people in this country um, have long struggled with racism and hate and discrimination against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Take, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act or the PAGE Act and the scapegoating of Japanese Americans for Pearl Harbor and World War II, which resulted in the internment of 125,000 Japanese American citizens in camps on American soil. We should not be surprised. This is nothing new. This has happened for a long time and throughout our history. It's a history that we have to confront and, and reckon with. And so let's not be surprised and let's not pretend that it's not happening now. The murder of the six Asian women in Atlanta or the shooting death of, of Sikhs a couple of weeks later in Indianapolis. This is all very real and it's happening today and we have to take it head on. And so again, right, these long echoes of racism manifesting and uh, materializing in this really problematic way where, you know, sadly we lose somebody like Vincent Chin, but then we see other people dying uh, in the same way as he had, you know, kind of the target 
of scapegoating, you know, not realizing that the larger issue in hand is the industrialization of capitalism and rather that we blame, you know, quote unquote, foreign people or quote unquote immigrants, right? So a very sad tome and, and obviously a, a pattern of, of, you know, kind of previous ills from the United States. So that's it for today. So we've kind of covered enduring anti-Asian racism, right? We see this with the Filipino problem, with the Japanese problem, and then the Korea-Vietnam problem, and obviously anti-Asian sentiments in the 80s and 90s. The key term for today is eumorphism. Again, remember that this is about constructing folks as animal or animalistic, um, but still following that kind of racist, dehumanistic framework. So with that, always um, email me if you have questions, and I thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.